morning, everyone. It is good to see everyone out there this morning. We are into the third week of our series of what it means to be a church member. If you've missed any of the messages that we have uh, talked about so far, uh, don't worry. We have them all archived on our website, so you can just go over to the church website and uh, catch up on what you missed. We are looking at a book called I Am a Church Member by Tom Rayner. Uh, we're just using it to be a Kickstarter to our conversation. Uh, if you're following along in the reading plan, we would have read up to chapter, including chapter three uh, for this week. I hope you've been enjoying it. Uh, it's always good to have different types of books, different authors, different thoughts in our collection, but there really is only one true source of authority uh, to compare all that to, and that is the word of God. Uh, everything should be evaluated and interpreted in light of the words of Jesus Christ. So I just want to mention that this morning, and we are going to open up our Bible. So if you want to grab them, if you don't have them next to you, go ahead and get off your uh, couch or chair and go ahead and grab your Bibles. We're going to read from Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 30. I'm going to read through the Passions translation this morning. It starts out, they went on from there. Wherever they were, they walked on through the, to the re uh, region of Galilee. Jesus didn't want the people to know where he was because he wanted to teach his disciples in private. He said to them, the son of man is destined to be betrayed and turned over to those who will execute him. But after three days, he will rise again. But the disciples didn't have a clue what he meant, and they were too embarrassed to ask him to explain. Then they came to Capernaum, and as soon as, as soon as Jesus was inside the house, he asked his disciples this question. What were you arguing about on the way to get here? No one could say a word because they had been arguing about which one of them was the greatest. So Jesus sits down. He calls the 12 disciples over to come around them, and he said this to them. If anyone wants to be first, he must be content to be last and become a servant to all. Then he had a child come up and stand among them. He wrapped the child in his arms and said to them, the disciples, Whoever welcomes a little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not only me, but the one who sent me. What does it mean to be a church member? This has been something that we've been talking about all along. We've been learning that there are responsibilities there are obligations to promote unity rather than benefits and perks. That pledging ourselves to Gingrichs is not about a commitment to a building or program, but rather to a local expression of believers who are giving themselves to one another for the sake of the kingdom of God. This is what membership means. All of this so that the kingdom of God may be established here on earth. Now, these ideas and concepts are altogether different from what membership looks like in the world. But even that, even because it's different for us, it was different for Jesus' disciples, what it means to be a group of people committed. I want you to picture that scene that we just read from the book of Mark. Picture that in your mind as Jesus has been slowly trying to tell his little children, these disciples. I find it ironic that some of the translations literally say little children as if they are still learning and growing. 
He was trying to help them understand these concepts because he was going to be leaving them soon. The text that we read this morning was the second time his disciples heard that he was going to be the suffering savior. And it was no less confusing than the first time. The news was devastating to them because they had given up their livelihoods for the sake of following a man who they thought would rescue them from a corrupt social and political climate as they were experiencing. So they were naturally confused. The things that Jesus had been telling them, the things about what it meant to be a part of the kingdom of God, of God's family, were not exactly what they anticipated. It wasn't exactly what they had expected. So Jesus and the disciples finally got to their destination after traveling, and Jesus says this question to them. What were you guys so adamantly discussing along the road to get to where we are? I'm sure this question that Jesus asked was not out of ignorance. Rather, he wanted them to admit, to admit their foolishness and do it out loud probably shocked that Jesus would overhear them. They were unable to speak. They were silent in their reaction. Now, this kind of conversation sounds very uh, familiar to me. Possibly it does to you. If you've ever gone on any long car rides, or for that matter, short car rides with kids in the back seat, Doug and I have asked that question many of times to our children. What exactly are you arguing about in the back seat? I mean, this is why they make minivans. It's not just to get more stuff in. It is literally to separate the children. <laughs> Jesus didn't have to ask that question. He knew, he knew full well what they were arguing about. They were kids. Arguing is part of the package. But for their benefit, Jesus asks, what were you discussing on the road trip? But they didn't answer because they had been arguing. Catch this. They had been arguing about which one of them was the greatest. If you are a part of a family that has multiple siblings, I know that this question has come up before. And if you are a parent, you know that you get, at times, you get tempted to pick favorites in your family. Well, in our house, I definitely have favorites. I'll say to my youngest daughter, Avery, you are my favorite youngest daughter. But in this scenario, the disciples were bickering amongst themselves. No wonder there was silence. When Jesus asked that question, he was exposing their deception, their reality of what they thought the kingdom of God was and how it operated. No wonder they did not want to admit because while Jesus was about his father's business of saving the world and establishing the kingdom of God, they were in the back seat having a petty argument about who was more qualified and who was more gifted. The apostle Mark, who captures uh, this precious moment in the life of the followers of Jesus, describes the ironic nature of what is really taking place. Jesus is days away from the suffering of the cruelest death that man has ever seen for the sake of his people. And the disciples were jostling for positions in the kingdom. And of course, they were taking their cues from societal norms of how power and authority work within family systems. And like any good father, Jesus sits down everyone for a family meeting. Now, if you have ever had to call a family meeting, you know that at times they are uh, the most non-anticipated, uh, dreaded meetings because usually there is a level of correction that needs to take place in these family meetings. 
but Jesus sits down first. Now, this is very noteworthy. It's intentional. It reflects his relationship to them. Now, I have to admit, I would have done the exact same thing. I would have sat down first. But it would have been because I needed to calm my emotions because there was a reason why I was having this family meeting, <laughs> was there not? But Jesus does this out of a desire to look them in the eye with compassion <laughs> rather than standing in authority. And he says this, let's sit down. Come on over here. Sit down. I want to talk to you a little bit. And then he proceeds to help them understand what the kingdom of God is like and how it is so very different than the human reign that they see around them. Whoever wants to be first must be last. They must take the last place and be the servant of everyone else. And with those words, Jesus establishes the difference between the human kingdom and a godly kingdom. Jesus says, my kingdom, my people, and the church that you are about to initiate, it's not about your preferences. It's not about your desires. And least of all, it is not about your attitude of entitlement. I mean, you probably could have heard a pin drop as the disciples heard Jesus talk. Time and time again throughout the Gospels, the kingdom of God comes into the world in the most unlikely ways, in the most unlikely places, through those who are minimalized and continuously ignored. The gospel came through the younger brother, through the demon-possessed man. It came through those with disabilities. It came through those who were suffering. Do you remember the bleeding woman? It came through the servants, the criminals, and children, just to mention a few that are recorded in the Bible. In a culture of honor and shame, where power and authority, where who you know is what grants you social status, Jesus, the king of the world, God in human flesh, sits down. He sits down to explain to the disciples that his kingdom is not like this world. Even in his teaching, he is showing it is different. He is sitting and explaining rather than standing up and towering over. I love the illustrations that Jesus uses. They're so real. They're so like everyday illustrations. And so he takes the nearest child who might be around. Are there any children out there? I want you to just wave. Do I see any children? I see one. Great. If we were together in person rather than on Zoom, I would have you come up front. It would have been much better to do that because I would wrap my arms around you just as Jesus said. He says, taking this child in my arms, anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me, welcomes not only me, but also my father who sent me. Now, why a child? I mean, why does Jesus choose a child to showcase what it means to put others first? Now, as I was recalling and preparing for this, I was really just laughing at myself. When I was a single woman, I knew I had a selfish side to me. When I became a wife, I became even more aware of this. Now, I didn't always uh, get my way. I mean, Doug, my husband, he's so compassionate, so easygoing. And at times, I usually give him about 49% of the time he gets to choose whatever he wants. <laughs> but it wasn't until I had children did I truly find out how selfish I was. There were countless ways to exercise my servitude muscles, my servanthood muscles, but nothing, and I mean nothing, would prepare me <clears throat> for how my body, 
how my time, how my money, and even how my future would not be my own anymore. Children are a great way to learn kingdom principles. Jesus must have not known this. Now, whether you have children, whether you don't have children, whether your children are still in the house, whether they are gone and flew the coop, it doesn't matter. We have the opportunity to surround ourselves with children every day. And we should, we should, because they teach us whether we are willing or not willing how to put others first. Jesus says that when you welcome a little child, you are welcoming him. In a culture that is steeped with the idea that those with much are more important than those who are without, Jesus is telling his disciples, he's teaching them that honor is not gained by pulling rank. It's not gained by demanding that you get to go first. In fact, it's the complete opposite. When we join the church, when we become members, we are to use our money, our time, our resources, our status. Whatever we have, we are to use it for the benefit of others. Jesus tells his disciples that the way to gain access into the kingdom is to welcome the least among you, to welcome them as first priority. Now, whoever that least is among us, Jesus is using the example of children because of how low on the totem pole they were in that culture. But whoever that least is among us, we should have that in our minds as we go forward. We are to let their preferences rise to the top of our list. We are to think about their desires more than our own. This is difficult, though. It's difficult when we have a culture that grooms us to be number one. There is no one more in a rude awakening for this type of concept than new parents. Have you ever seen a parent who has just been a parent for maybe one to two weeks? Uh, they are what? They are sleep deprived and maybe short fused as they've been trying to navigate uh, what it means to take care of this little bundle or how to console a crying baby. It is a shock like no other. It's an immersion to servitude. Caring for the needs of such a little baby, a helpless, vulnerable being, putting their needs above your own, they find out soon, has now become their responsibility. And if they choose not to have it as their responsibility, they may be subject to being called out for child neglect. Now, I've entitled this message this morning, I am a church member who puts others first. Being a part of a church family means it is our responsibility to put others first, to put their needs above our own. The ways of the kingdom of God represent the ways God has shown himself, shown his love to us through his son. Because he never asks us to carry out a responsibility that he has not carried out himself. We can never call Jesus on the carpet and say, well, you never did that. You're asking us to do that. Uh, I have to admit, my kids play that game with me often. And at times they are right. At times I am not carrying out the things that I am saying. But that is not the case for Jesus as he is teaching his disciples. When we were helpless and vulnerable, unable to get loose from the effects that sin have on us, have on us, it was Jesus who took upon himself. He took upon himself the responsibility of putting us first before himself. See, this was the journey that he was walking out as he was teaching these young disciples. It was his very lesson. Those words that are in the scriptures, whoever wants to be the first must take the last place 
and be the servant of everyone else. These were not just words to Jesus. He would act them out on the cross. When we think about creating a culture where people encounter the very presence of God at Gingrichs, I know that's what we are desiring. When we think about creating a culture like that in our own families, in our homes, in our schools, in our places of employment, in the people that we surround ourselves, are we considering welcome are we considering that when we welcome the least among us the ones that society places uh last have you considered that when we do that we are actually giving the opportunity to encounter the presence of god see jesus taught this correlation between welcoming the least among us and being in the presence of him he said that self-denial is the path of true joy, and it's the entrance into life with him, into a real encounter with him. He said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must first deny himself, take up his cross, and then follow me. Go where I am going. Do what I am doing. Speak what I am speaking. For whoever wishes to save his life will, in fact, lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And again, these are not just words. They're not just words that Jesus just talks out of his mouth. He actually acted them out on the cross. He acted them out to the point of death. He was still welcoming the least among him, as he had his hands stretched out on the cross. His very last act before death, before the unfinished, the drawing of his last breath, was welcoming the criminal who hung beside him on the cross. If you think you have no more to offer, think again. If you are not breathing in your last breath, there is more that God has for you. The one who was rightfully accused, who hung on the cross before him, the one who was rightfully accused of wrongdoing, was the one that Jesus welcomed in. The one who was wrongfully accused was the one who was welcoming. Jesus lived and breathed, putting others first within the family of God. He was the ultimate church member. By focusing on the ones that are usually forgotten, Jesus establishes the kingdom of God here on earth. So who are the ones who are forgotten in our culture? Who are the ones who are forgotten in our churches? And how are we placing their needs above our own? Who are the fatherless? Who are the marginalized? Who are the poor? Who are the powerless? Who are the ones who do not have a voice, who don't have a seat at the table of power? We need to give them a voice. We need to pull up a chair and invite them in. Now, these are all reflective questions um, that will be coming to light as we go uh, a part of this vision process, but they're not just for that. These are personal questions as well. If Jesus were to ask us that same question that he asked the disciples, what are you discussing along the road? Would, be, would we be just as guilty or would we be wrapped up in trying to welcome in others? Our hope is that we are recommitting ourselves as we go through this series, that we are recommitting ourselves to one another, to the local body, the expression. The hope is that we are reminding ourselves who we are as a community of believers. If you have that list of uh, congregational covenant that uh, we sign when we become a member, if you have that with you, please 
please pull it out. Like I said, we are going to be going over it every single week, hopefully tweaking it a bit. So this morning, I'm going to read through it in light of what we just learned. When we sign up to be a member at Gingrich's, what we are saying is we intend to, we commit to the words and the actions of Jesus. We intend to be committed to being transformed into the likeness of Christ so that we can be the body, that we can be a family fully functioning together who holds true both the living and the written word of God. And we do all of this. We are intending to do all of this so that we could carry out the mission of God into the world to those who are lost. I mean, the message isn't for those who are found. The message is for those who are lost. Now, let me uh, just conclude our time together by sharing an example of members of a family putting others first. This example, it might come as a little bit of a surprise giving our pacifist theology, but nonetheless, it is a powerful illustration conveying what Jesus uh, was trying to get at with honor and how we go about honor by putting others first. Simon Sinek, who became very popular with a TED Talk on leadership, perhaps you've uh, read some of his, his books or heard him before, but he asked a question of a Marine general. Uh, he said, what makes a Marine or the Marines great? What makes the Marines great? He responds by, well, leaders eat last. If you were to go to any chow, that means the mess hall of where the Marines eat. If you would go to any chow anywhere in the world, no matter if they were stationed uh, here or abroad, you would see the Marines line up in rank order. order. The first would be the private first class. They would jump up and head to the head of the line. Then there would be the Lance Corporals. Next, the Corporals. Then the senior enlisted, and then the officers, the ones who are the most highest rank, they would be at the back of the line. Now, there's no written policy for this in the handbook, uh, and it is quite startling the first time uh, Marine sets foot into the chow hall for his first uh, meal. It's just a time-honored tradition. Everybody knows leaders eat last. I find this extremely fascinating given the amount of hierarchy uh, that is in our branches of military, but what is more fascinating is that they do this because they view leadership and family life within the group differently than our culture does. See, we see rank, but they see responsibility. We see, well, we deserve to be first. And they see, I want to serve those who are under me. This premise is the same concept that Jesus talked about 2,000 years ago and that he shared with his disciples as he asked them to sit down and listen. He was beginning to establish the kingdom of God and he wanted his little children to know this is how we operate in this family. Our faithful king and leader, Jesus Christ, went into the battle to protect us. He put our needs above his own. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He took the bullet of death so that we would not have to. He gave his life in lieu of our life. See, the army of God's wrath was coming straight at us, right into our sin. But Jesus stood up. He gladly bore all of that 
the weight of God's wrath so that we would not have to bear it. This concept is both practical and beyond my comprehension. This concept of putting others first, though, it's not a theory. It's not just theology out there. It is our faith tradition. It's the reality that we are being called into, to live into. We live because he died and three days later rose in his resurrection. We are now called to be members of his church, where he's the head of. And we are now called to do that for others. I am a church member and I put others first. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Father God, I want to thank you, first of all, that you use everyday examples because there's sometimes I just don't understand these concepts because they go against our human nature. But your word is so living and on fire. It just pierces us when we look at a little child and when we see what you see. Holy Spirit, I ask that as we go about our day today, this next week, this next month, that you would help us to be in tuned with the marginalized, with those who are forgotten, the least among us. Help us to see them and then help us to see them through your eyes, Lord. We are so thankful, Father, that you saw us that way when we were helpless, vulnerable, and unable to save ourselves, you put us first. You didn't have to leave the throne room of heaven. You didn't have to leave there and step down onto earth, but you did. You faithfully were obedient to the Father's will. You carried it out all for us, and I am asking that you would empower us to do the same for others. We ask all these things, all these things in the, the name of the Father, whose will it was for this to happen. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, the blood of Christ that was shed for me and for you. We ask all these things in the name of the Spirit who empowers us to go about this mission. Amen. Amen.